Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your host for Christian Answers. I want to thank you for being with us today as we delve into various and sundry topics that relate to the Christian faith. The topic today is on the subject of Islam, specifically, what does Islam really say about women? Now, this is a, a fascinating topic, and our director of research for Christian Answers, Steve Morrison, has done quite a bit of delving into this subject, and this show is going to be a result of his research in this field. Steve, it's great to have you here. Well, thank you, Larry. Fantastic uh, research as usual. We have done many shows in the past on this. Uh, one of our newsletters here, uh, just on page five, for instance, lists just a, a large number of videos we've already done on Islam. There's many more we have done, but this is going to be a new uh, topic, you might say, in this whole subject of Islam, and one that uh, I think will relate particularly to uh, a large segment of society, particularly the women, mm -hmm. <laughs> who uh, I think comprise at least half the, the society, so they may find this very interesting. What Islam really says about women. Now, I know, Steve, that when you're dealing with uh, Muslim apologists, uh, and I want you to elaborate a little, about, uh, a little bit on what a Muslim apologist is for the, the viewer, uh, but when you're talking to Muslim spokesmen, let me say, or, or people who, who are trying to put a, maybe a, a, a good side to Islam, a lot of times they would just say, well, Islam is good to women, you know, it, 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 it holds up women's, uh, uh, you know, rights to dignity and these types of things. In other words, they'll say many good things, mm -hmm. but are they really giving us authoritative quotations from uh, actual Islamic sources? That's what we want to know. And, and, and I know in a politically correct age, it may not be wise for, let's say, a Muslim spokesman to really give us what the actual authoritative Muslim reference works would actually say. Okay. And so uh, with that, uh, Steve, and in light of the fact that we've done so many shows in the past, uh, and of course for our viewing audience, we are coming from a Christian perspective. After all, this show is Christian Answers. Mm -hmm. And what we want to show by this analysis of what Islam really says about women is is Islam actually the truth, the, the actual true religion that shows the reality of which we live? Or based on what it teaches, particularly in this case about women, can it be trusted? And is there perhaps, and of course from our view, uh, something of greater authority such as the Bible, the Word of God, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, would that be maybe superior to what we're being taught in Islam about women? Now, with all that said, I'd like to turn the show over now to Steve to, Steve, uh, just explain to the, the viewers what a Muslim apologist is. You might want to mention probably Dr. Jamal Badawi mm -hmm. and, and give us a little background on him and then lead into this whole subject of what Islam says or what they really say about women. Okay. Well, a Muslim apologist is a Muslim person who's trying to convert people to Islam or show that Islam is true, um, just as a Christian apologist is a person who tries to, to show the truth of Christianity. Uh, one uh, very noted uh, Muslim apologist is Jamal Badawi, and he wrote a booklet called Gender Equity in Islam, where uh, he discussed it and provided some quotes, and, and except for one questionable place, which we'll get into later, you know, the quotes he provides are, are all accurate but he only showed half the picture. In fact, I would say less than half the picture. And there were so many um, misconceptions and, and things put in there that, that we felt that, that this needed to be corrected. And so this uh, vid video series, three-part series, is really a response um, to uh, Jamal Badawi's booklet to say, well, what about the majority part, that the, the, the quotes? We don't have so much problem with the quotes he put in. We have lots and lots of problems with the quotes he left out. Now, so you're talking about a sin of omission, perhaps, and uh, also, just to uh, further elaborate for our audience, Dr. Jamal Badawi, uh, for a, a Muslim out there might say, well, well, who's he? He's probably just some minor guy out there that hardly anyone knows, and you're just picking on somebody that really doesn't know much about Islam. Is Dr. Jamal, Jamal Badawi that important to even discuss, or 
what is his stature among Muslim apologists? Well, he, he's probably uh, one of the top Muslim apologists, you know, uh, who are alive today. Uh, he has at least 176 tapes, maybe some more I, I don't know about, but at, mm -hmm. at, at least uh, that many. Uh, he, he's written uh, some booklets and things like that. So this particular booklet that he has in Gender Equity is 59 pages. Mm -hmm. So for a booklet that big with a lot to say, it's like it's kind of amazing that he left out so much key stuff. So Dr. Jamal Badawi is not just a, a, a little fry, let's say, but he is more of one of the the, the greater Muslim apologists that's particularly, uh, is, in my understanding, he's the number one Muslim apologist on the North American continent, particularly because he speaks English mm -hmm. and uh, can relate the, the Muslim religion in English to the North American audience. Okay. So uh, with that, Steve, uh, take us into the show. All right. Well, uh, <clears throat> b b before we critique what Dr. Badawi says, we need to, uh, I guess, uh, kind of reiterate what Dr. Badawi himself claims uh, about his different practices. All right, on the start of his booklet on page one, he explicitly distances himself from some of the diverse cultural practices of Islam that are either not found in the Quran and the Hadith or maybe even contradict the original teachings. So he mentions some things like total seclusion of women inside the home, uh, female circumcision, uh, calling prostitution temporary marriage, and, and, and just other kinds of practices like that that if they don't have their support in the Quran and the Hadith, um, then he doesn't even try to defend them. And that certainly seems reasonable to us. I mean, there are people who do things in, in the name of Christianity that, that are not Christian, they're against the Bible, and we don't even try to defend those, so, so, so that's fine. But, however, there's still plenty of stuff left from defend. <laughs> okay, now next question is, which Islam are we speaking about? There's uh, Sufi Islam, there's Shiite Islam, there's Sunni Islam. There are various sects among the different groups. There are some really strange things, uh, you know, whether Alawites or Jews or stuff. Well, Dr. Badawi is a Sunni Islam, and very upfront, he says that the authentic Sunnah, and Sunnah roughly means tradition, um, is the second primary source of Islamic teachings after the Quran. He says on page 47, another common term that some authorities consider to be equivalent to Sunnah is Hadith, or the plural is Ahadith which literally means sayings. Uh, Badawi gave a clear example of the importance of Hadith um, that, that, that we had not considered before. He said the Quran says that Muslims should pray, but doesn't give any details. It's only in the Hadith that provide hundreds of pages of instructions on the times of prayer, when to pray, how long to pray, and other mechanics. Okay, thus, Dr. Badawi uh, clearly bases all of his arguments on the Quran and authoritative Hadith, with a few things from he throws in from Al-Tabari and other sources. And Al-Tabari is a major early Muslim historian. If you accept that the Hadiths are generally accurate teachings, then we think that Dr. Bari's choices of authorities is perfectly reasonable. Among other things, Badawi quotes that women, as well as men, are spiritual, both have inherent dignity. Women have property rights and can inherit, though in the, from the Quran they can only inherit half as much. Badawi also admonishes people in general on page 145 not to allow what he calls cultural peculiarities to be an excuse for the oppression of men and women in Islamic countries that is not Islamic. Okay. Well, <clears throat> Badawi's pamphlet, he gives the impression that Islam says only nice things about women. While that's not correct, uh, we want to say that Islam does say some nice things about women and wives, and here are some of them. Uh, narrated Abu Huraira, Abba's apostle said, Treat women nicely, for a woman is created from a rib, and the most curved portion of the rib is its upper portion. So, if you should try to straighten it, it will break. But if you leave it as it is, it will remain crooked. So treat women nicely. From Bukhari, uh, Volume 4, uh, 548, page 346. Abu Huraira, I'll be, be pleased with him, reported, Woman has been created from a rib and will no way be straightened for you. So if you wish to benefit by her, benefit by her while crookedness remains in her. And if you attempt to straighten her, you will break her. And breaking her is divorcing her. This is in Sahih Muslim, uh, Volume 2, 3467, page 752. Also Sahih Muslim, uh, 2, 3466 and 3468, you know, page 752 and 753. And this, uh, this thought is also in Bukhari, Volume 7, uh, 113, page 80. Muhammad in a sermon said, It is not wise for any one of you to lash his wife like a slave. Apparently that would be too severe. For the wife, that is, not the slave. Uh, Bukhari 6, 466, page 440. Likewise, Ibn Majah 3, 1983, page 194, says in a sermon Muhammad criticized Muslim men who beat their wives like they beat their slave girls. It could be a bummer to be a slave girl. In contrast to this, 
Uh, Galatians 3.28 in the Bible says that in the Christ there is no male or female. While some ancient cultures might have thought of sons as superior to daughters, Galatians 3.28 specifically says both believing men and women are sons in Christ Jesus, at least in, you know, in, in regards to there's their value. A, there's an equality between men and women in the Christian faith in that, that according to Galatians 3.28, there is neither bond nor free, female or male. We're all one in Christ. Right. And so there's an equality between men and women as presented in the Christian gospel that you find in the Bible. But you're stating that this is not so in the Islamic faith. Well, on one hand, uh, Badawi is trying to say that it is so, or almost so. But the, the truth is, it's, it, it is not so. It's, and it's not just a little inferior, it is, it is greatly inferior. And we're, and we're going to go into some of these ways, detailed by Muslims themselves. Right, and uh, so basically, he's trying to soften the blow of mm -hmm. this great discrepancy we would find even on this, this this point here between the Christian view of women being equal to that of men and the Islamic view of women, which is far from that. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah, uh, just on women in general, uh, here's what Muhammad said. A slave is a shepherd of his master's property, and a wife is a shepherd of her husband's house and children. Abu Dhab, uh, 2, uh, 29, 22, page 827. So there's kind of like, wife's not a slave, but, but there is a, a similar parallel there. Okay. Well, how are women inferior in Muslim society? A Muslim counts the ways. During the zenith of Islamic culture, Muslim scholar Al-Ghazali, who lived from 1058 to 1111 AD, cataloged a list of 18 ways women are inferior to men in Islam. Here are nine of them that relate to wisdom and culture. They have lesser inheritance. They have liability to divorce and inability to divorce. Men can have multiple wives, but a woman can only have one husband. The wife must stay secluded at home. This is according to Al-Ghazali. A woman must keep her head covered inside the house. A woman's court testimony is only counted as half of a man. She cannot leave the house except accompanied by a near relative. Only men can take part in Friday and feast day prayers and funerals. And a woman cannot be a ruler and judge. And this is from, you can look at Why I'm Not a Muslim, page 300, for all of the 18 ways. Okay, and just one that kind of, to me, tops everything off is Muhammad said, O oh, women, give alms, as I have seen that the majority of the dwellers of hellfire were you, meaning women. They asked, Why is it so, O oh, Allah's apostle? He replied, You curse frequently and are ungrateful to your husbands. I have not seen anyone more deficient in intelligence and religion than you. And dot, dot, dot. The women asked, O oh, Allah's apostle, what is deficient in our intelligence and religion? He said, Is not the evidence of two women equal to the witness of one man? They replied in the affirmative. He said, This is deficiency in your intelligence. Isn't it true that a woman can neither pray nor fast during her menses, you know, meaning monthly period? The women replied in the affirmative. He said, This is the deficiency of your religion. And this is a quote from Al Bukhari, uh, volume 1, uh, 301, page 181. And you can see the, the nine volume Al Bukhari is, uh, is behind me. And you can order it you know, from Islamic bookstores. Um, and that Bukhari actually has the Arabic and the English. So if you happen to speak Arabic, you can um, you know, compare what the Arabic itself says. You can also get, uh, get these references from the Alim through Islamic sources, which is on a CD. Mm -hmm. It has all the uh, authoritative Islamic hadiths on one CD. Put it in your computer. And you can look up all these references without having to buy all these books. But, of course, we, you know, Steve has all the books and has read all of them. And in fact, I think on our website, uh, Muslim Hope, www.muslimhope.com, you have uh, 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 Islam reference index of over 4,100 entries, mainly from the, the Sunni Hadiths. Right. And a lot of this is listed right there on your website, our website, yeah, uh, see, for it, anyone I, to look up. It, it, yeah, it, 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 it's... Doesn't replace buying the books, but 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 it but it's a paraphrase to kind of show you if you already have the books to show you how you can rapidly find things in there. Right, without spending all day trying to dig them up, you right. can find them quickly. Right. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Well, Dr. Badawi obviously would disagree with with the the eminent uh, early Muslim scholar Al Ghazali. So let's look. Let's go back to the sources in the Hadith and the Quran, and 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 just see kind of which Muslim would be right. Okay, uh, here's uh, one that you can think about with equality. Uh, it says, narrated Aisha, and Aisha was Muhammad's most beloved wife, or maybe after Khadija, her second most beloved, either way. But, do you make us women equal to dogs and donkeys? While I used to lie in my bed, the Prophet Muhammad would come and pray facing the middle of the bed. I used to consider it not good to stand in front of him in his prayers. So I used to slip away slowly and quietly from the foot of the bed till I got out of my guilt. 
This is Bukhari 1, 486, page 289. So let's analyze this statement. Aisha probably said this because Muhammad taught that her prayer was invalid if a dog or woman passed in front of her. Nothing actually says that the prayer of a woman is invalid if a man passed in front of her, but she felt this great guilt for having to be in a certain place you know, when Muhammad was praying. I mean, not Muhammad's guilt, but her guilt for just being there. Okay. Also, a black dog or a woman or a dog and a menstruating woman can cut off prayer. This is according to the uh, Hadith Abu Dawud, Volume 1, 702 and 703, page 181. Okay. So let's look at inheritance. In Orthodox Islam, daughters only get half the inheritance of their brothers. And this is because in the Quran, Surah 411 says, Allah thus directs you as regarding your children's inheritance to the male, a portion to that of two females. This is from Yusuf Ali's translation, page 209. And by the way, when we have these uh, quotes from the Quran, the words in parentheses are words that the translator put in, but the parentheses tell you that it's not actually in the Arabic. And sometimes in some places there are lots of parentheses. <laughs> anyway, Dr. Badawi on page 17 acknowledges this, but says the reason women have less inheritance is because men should shoulder more of the burden for breadwinning. Actually, though, having women inherit as much as men poses no hardship for men uh, versus them only getting half as much. By the way, in Pakistan, Syria, and Egypt, they don't allow the women to inherit anything according to Voices Behind the Veil, page 131. However, we'll point out that that is against the Quran, which says they should at least get half as much. Right. Okay. In contrast to this, prior to Muhammad in the Old Testament, daughters could inherit the same amount of land as their sons. Uh, Zalafahad's daughters inherited in Numbers 27, 7 through 8. The only restriction on women's inheritance in those times, since the land was to remain within the tribe, Numbers 36 8 said the daughters who inherited land had to marry within the tribe. And in the New Testament, in 1 Peter 1 3 through 4, all believers, as men and women, they have the greatest inheritance of all, inheritance in heaven. And what a man has to look forward to in heaven in the Bible is, this, is just as good as what a woman has to look forward to, and vice versa. Amen. So apparently already we're getting a discrepancy here. Uh, even on, on the level of inheritance, we have problems in prayer can be cut off by dogs and women. And, and women. Uh, I don't know, in a way, if I were a woman, uh, that might be an insult to me to think that I could actually interrupt someone's prayer just because I'm in the area. Uh, just like a dog, and dogs are not looked on very highly. Yeah, in, and, and to be put in the then. same breath as a dog, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and this is, you, you know, in our modern American culture, we have, you know, a lot of times... Uh, Guys, uh, you know, as a slander against maybe more non-pretty women, they call them dogs, you know. But here we have a fact that Muhammad, going way back to 600 A.D., is referring to women in the same breath as dogs on the level of a dog. So it's not even, I mean, to me that seems even worse than our common American uh, slander of just calling, you know, a, 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 a kind of a, a homely woman, a dog. Yeah, and, uh, and, he's, and, he's and, actually putting the woman on the level of a dog itself. At least if I interrupt her. And, and by the way, you know, you, you should never, there's no point of ever insulting anybody or, or right. calling them a dog. Exactly. But, 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 but in Islam, it's not just comparing them to dogs. As far as property, women have, there's kind of a concept of almost like women as property. Uh, for example, uh, in Ibn Majah 3, 1918, uh, page 157, it says, When one is given a woman, servant, or cattle, one should seize his forehead and pray to Allah, like pray to Allah uh, to, to be grateful for getting it. So women, servant, cattle, kind of all the same category. So, and so, where is that located? Uh, this is Ibn Majah uh, 3, 1918, page 157. Okay, also, uh, it, it, the idea is not to, so much to abuse women, but to treat them well, like you would treat an animal well. For example, it says, treat women well, for they're like domestic animals, and the word there is awan, with you, and do not possess anything for themselves. This is in Al-Tabari, volume 9, page 113. Okay, now one peculiarity is that Al-Tabari, he was an Orthodox Muslim, but the only um, thing is he strongly believed that women should never own anything. And many Muslim scholars uh, disagree with that and say it's okay for them to own stuff. So uh, there's a little disagreement here. But anyway, the general view of women you can kind of see coming through here. Okay. Now, uh, Al-Ghazali, if you remember, he said that, and, and, and Muhammad said that women couldn't pray at certain times. Now, a Muslim told me, he said, he never, uh, or she never ever heard of a time when women couldn't pray. Well, she probably hasn't read all the Hadiths. Uh, for example, women are to abandon prayer during their time of month. 
This is according to Sahih Muslim, Volume 1, 652, page 188 and 189, and also Volume 2, 1932 to 1934, also explained in a footnote 1163, all on page 418 and 419. This is in Bukhari, Volume 1, 322, page 194, and Volume 1, 327, 196, also in Sunan Nasai, Volume 1, number 355 to 361, that's page 281 to 284, and Volume 1, number 364 to 368, page 285 to 286. This is in Abu Dawud, uh, 3, 4662, uh, page 1312. Okay, so one of the key wrongs of Christians and Jews, according to these Hadiths, is that they prayed at the wrong time. So, according to the Islamic beliefs, you're only to pray at certain times, and women, for instance, aren't even allowed to pray at certain times, right? Even even designated times, because right. of other conditions that would uh, that would cut them off from being able to talk to God. But in a Christian faith, you are in constant communication with God at all times, mm -hmm. and you can talk to God any time your heart desires, because God, who is love, as First John talks about, uh, is ready to hear his children because there's a loving relationship there between God and his children. Uh, but you, and of course, God is a father to us as his his children. Now you have kids of your own. You have four kids, right? And you would. Is there ever been a time when you told your kids if they wanted to come and see you or just sit on your lap or hug you or something like that? You'd say, No, I don't want you. You know, like Mary, for instance. Mm. You know, one of your daughters' name is Mary. Mary, I don't want you to talk to me for at least two days. No. And then maybe after that, you can come and see me for uh, 15 minutes uh, Wednesday. I'll write it in my appointment book, and maybe you can talk <laughs> me. But uh, that's only if you clean up your room. There's a condition here. Yeah. Now she, 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 she can come anytime, even when I'm working. She can always kind of because they, it's they can a, always come and give me it's a, a loving hug. relationship. Right. And uh, that's the kind of relationship that Christians have with God. Yeah, but it, but Muslims can't say the same thing. Right. In in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 to 18, and in Ephesians 6, uh, here's the Christian rule for, for when we can pray. It says, pray without ceasing. Amen. <laughs> okay. Women also, according to Islam, are, are, are roughly half as intelligent as a man. According to Muslim Sharia, which is the, the Muslim law, the witness of a woman is equal uh, to half of a man because of the deficiency of the women's mind. And this is not a, a, a Muslim opinion or, or, or jurist saying this. This is actually from the Hadiths themselves, from Bukhari, Volume 3, uh, 826, page 502. Now, what do most Muslims think of al-Bukhari, uh, the Sunni Muslims? Uh, uh, Sunni Muslims who, who have studied Islam, we should qualify that, uh, the, 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 the Hadiths in general are the highest authority in Islam, uh, the, the authority of Hadith besides the Quran. Now, there are six authoritative collections, and of these six collections, Bukhari is the highest collection. You know, you have a lot of these Hadiths right behind you. Uh, but the, the light colored ones are Bukhari, Abu Dawud is the blue one over there, so he moves on the second highest, is next to Abu Bakari. Down there in the other shelf, I have Ibn Majah and Nasai. Uh, I don't have a copy of, of Termidy in English, so I don't have that one. Right, but but these of all these you've just shown the audience, uh, the Al Bukhari is what they consider the most authoritative of these right. hadiths. Right. And so when you quote from Al Bukhari about the intelligence, the deficiency of a woman's mind, mm -hmm. that has a lot of weight to it in the Islamic religion. Right. It 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 it, it uh, to deny the hadith. The Hadith for a Sunni Muslim is sort of like um, a, let's say, a, a, a Greek Orthodox uh, or, or Catholic Christian saying that I, I, I reject everything in church tradition. You know, it, it just does, doesn't, doesn't happen too much. So, so what is it that makes a Sunni Muslim a Sunni is Sunnah means tradition. So mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, then if, if you deny it, fine, but then you're, you're really kidding yourself if you say you're a Sunni Muslim. It's like a Catholic priest saying, I, I don't believe in the Pope. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so. okay, speaking of Hadith and transmitting the Hadith, it says a chain of transmission is controversial uh, if for no other reason if it includes a woman. And this is according to Ibn Majah uh, 5, 3863, page 227. And also says translation of woman is not as good as by man, according to Sunan Nasai, volume 1, page 84. Okay. Now, to me, the worst thing that I 
to feel about this is not that Muslim writers could be considered male chauvinist pigs for saying women have deficient minds. To me, the worst thing is one time I was talking with an educated Pakistani woman, a friend of mine, who she was trying to justify and explain to me why she believed that this was true. So it's like the women themselves, even educated women, believe they aren't very intelligent. So, so a highly sophisticated, eloquent, probably very intelligent woman is mm -hmm. trying to explain to you why she's not any of the above. Right. Why she and women in general. Right. <laughs> right. See, so, so it's kind of you know it's kind of like it forces them on their own thinking. And 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 again, just another reminder: Galatians 3:28 in the Bible says there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Right. So once again, okay. the 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 vast difference between the, the Christian view of men and women and the Islamic view. It's almost like the Islamic view was written by a man who basically had those chauvinistic characteristics that the, you know, like women livers are so much against. Yeah, it, it, it was it, almost it, like a tailor-made male religion built to help out the males and not the females. Right. Either that or, or the Muslim would argue back to say, well, maybe women really are only half as intelligent. According to Muslim Sharia law, the witness of a woman is equal to half that of a man because of the deficiency of the woman's mind. According to Al-Bakari, 3, 826, page 502, Muhammad said that a nation will never succeed that makes a woman their ruler. This according to Al-Bakari 9, 219, page 171. Additionally, Eve was originally intelligent. Allah, however, made her stupid after the fall. This according to official Islamic authoritative source Al-Tabari, Volume 1, pages 280 through 281. Now, now, now how does this bear in, in, in a Muslim court of law? Well, in, according to uh, in Islamic law, it says, narrated Abu Sa'id al-Qudri, uh, the prophet said, isn't the witness of a woman equal to half of that of a man? The woman said, yes. He said, this is because of the deficiency of the woman's mind. This is according to Al-Bukhari uh, 3, 826, page 502. Okay. Even in the Quran, uh, in Surah 2, 282 says, and get two witnesses out of your own men. And if there are not two men, then a man and two women, such as you choose for witnesses, so that if one of them errs, the other can remind her. So that, so that if one woman doesn't remember right, the other woman can help her so together they can remember. But you don't need that for man, just for women, because it's basically saying their memories aren't so good. Right. All right. So, but in a court of law, they can't have that. Now, how does Dr. Battery handle this? You know, he's aware of these. And in his booklet on page 34 and 35, he acknowledges this. But he also quotes Surah 24, 6 through 9, which gives both husband and wife equal weight on charges of infidelity of the wife. So Dr. Badawi says Surah 2, 282 applies only to commercial transactions, and Surah 24, 6 through 9 applies to everything else. However, there's no basis for that. It'd be just as reasonable for all other Muslims to say 24, 6 through 9 applies to only infidelity, and Surah 2, 282 applies to everything else. So it was selective uh, reasoning by Dr. Badawi on how he wanted to use these particular verses in dealing with this situation. Right. They, they, there's no qualification in the Quran that says, you know, don't pay attention to this verse except in this situation. Right. So okay. he is basically overlapping his opinion over what the Quran would say to try to get out of an obvious reference to the deficiency of women's minds. Right. Regardless, though, of Badawi's novel interpretation, all should agree that the, since the vast majority of Muslims who practice Sharia have a common interpretation that applies to almost everything, then either Allah failed to communicate what he intended to the vast majority of Muslims, or Badawi is right and the Muslim consensus has misunderstood Allah's wishes all these centuries, or Dr. Badawi is, is wrong and, and Allah did communicate clearly. I think it's fairly obvious in this case uh, that uh, millions of Muslims over hundreds of years would probably overrule Dr. Badawi's interpretation. Right. So, so applying this today, whose word would count if a Muslim man were to rape a woman? I mean, if a Muslim man were to rape a woman, the man's word would count twice as much as the woman's. Uh, for that matter, the word of a non-Muslim does not count at all in a court of law against a Muslim. So if a Muslim man rapes a non-Muslim woman, even if a second Muslim non-Muslim woman is present, his word that he did not do it would count equal to the word of both of them. Now, there's a real problem with this in, in Pakistan in that many women uh, had, uh, are, they're raped 
and they accuse the rapist. And so um, it's his word against theirs, and the woman wins out if there are other witnesses to the action. But if there are no other witnesses, then the woman is, it has been involved in illicit sexual intercourse by alleging the rape, and that you can't prove the the man the man did it because uh, or it was rape because the, the the man denies it and so the woman actually gets thrown into jail and the man goes free and wow. there are hundreds of women in pack in Pakistani jails um, and no corresponding men so they, they were raped but then simply by reporting it because right. they can't prove it by this Sharia rule uh, they end up in jail rather than the rapist right. And, and the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan said that in an annual report that one woman is raped every three hours in Pakistan. And even worse, 72% of all women in police custody in Pakistan are physically and sexually abused. And the Women's Action Forum says that 75% of all women in jail are under charge of Xena fornication. It was never stated how many men, if any, were in jail for that. You can see See Why I'm Not a Muslim, page 324, for information and examples. Okay. So well, that's pretty shocking, you know. Yeah, but, and that's a direct result of the Islamic religion. Mm -hmm. The Islamic religion is really the basis for this kind of problem with rape. Not just the Hadith, but also the Quran itself. Exactly. So here you have a consequence to the religion you practice. Mm -hmm. The consequence in this case is rape, imprisonment, and, and, and abuse. And it goes right back to the very religion they're practicing. Right. Well, also another thing in slavery, if you free from slavery one Muslim man or two Muslim women, it frees one from hellfire. This is according to Ibn Majah uh, 3, 2522, page 509. Now, this is fascinating to me. You know, this, I thought I knew a lot about Islam by now, but I didn't. <laughs> this is a new one for me. Uh, are you saying that, according to what you just read, and the people can see it on the PowerPoint, uh, graphic there. Uh, you free a slave and you're actually getting someone out of hellfire? What is the actual... No, no, no. What, it, what does it, that mean? If you free a... It has to be a Muslim slave. Okay. If you... It, it, uh, that, that you that, that you yourself won't... If you're a Muslim, won't go to hell. If you free a Muslim man from, uh, from slavery or two Muslim women. Okay, so it's talking about if you do this, you're actually getting yourself off the hook to yeah. go to hell. Kind of like a get-out-of-jail-free pass. Oh, wow. Okay, I, that, that's just a new one for me. I, I'm su surprised at that. So uh, a lot of these guys who think they can go straight to heaven by uh, uh, killing themselves or getting killed in a, in a jihad, a, mm -hmm. a holy war, here's another way to get out of going to hell and maybe go to heaven by just right. simply <laughs> freeing some Muslim slaves somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then you can, get, you can get to heaven that way also. And that would indicate more of a, a works uh, righteousness type of way of salvation based on the Islamic religion, Definitely. rather than what we find in the in in the Bible, which is a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting His shed blood for our forgiveness through His blood to atone for our sins. Mm -hmm. So it's a totally different concept of salvation and how you attain heaven. Yeah. In this case, you just free somebody and hey, you're out of jail free. You know, you right. don't need a monopoly set. Yeah, so, so we've been t talking about the Muslim view of women's intelligence and how that corresponds in, in Muslim law, both in the past and today. Uh, let's contrast that briefly with what the Bible says. Okay, well, wh why is women <coughs> are mentioned in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel 14:2 uh, tw and 20, 16 to 22? You know, men would, you know, they would even, even give advice to men. Okay, the virtuous wife speaks with wisdom in Proverbs 31:26. Okay, you know, when if if you're not married and you're looking for a wife, you want to marry a wife who's wise, and you can find a wife who's wise, at least according to the Bible. Now, maybe right. not according to Islam. Okay, of course, you know, what if you're not wise, uh, or you feel you're not wise? Well, Psalm 19:7 says that God makes wise the simple, so God can make you wise. Okay, uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that we'll necessarily be wise in worldly knowledge or things that don't matter, but we can all be wise in the knowledge of God if we apply ourselves and claim God's promise. Okay. And uh, that reminds me also of the book of James. I think it's chapter one, uh, where it says, "If any let let you seek God. If any of you lack wisdom or, mm -hmm. or des desire wisdom, God will give it to you." Right. And that and that goes for women or men, regardless. Regardless. So there's no distinction there on who God will give His wisdom to if right. you simply ask. Right. And then as for women in, in employment, uh, Dr. Badawi, Muslims kind of differ on this a little bit. And Dr. Badawi's view is that it's okay for women to seek employment and to work, 
when there is necessity for it, is what he says. Uh, however, that's the least better than the Taliban, which wouldn't let the women work at all, even when they were starving. Um, You're talking about in Afghanistan. Yeah. And, uh, and in contrast to this, in Proverbs 31, uh, 10 to 31, it, it shows about the, the wise wife who was, who was doing buying and selling and making things and having her own business. Um, she didn't need her husband's consent. Uh, it was all part of a family, um, and, and, and she, was, she was smart enough to have her own business and do her own work. That's right. You know, uh, and the family in, in, in Proverbs 31 was, was well off. So what we're seeing here is a very stark contrast between uh, women presented in the, the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, mm-hmm. and women presented in the Quran and the uh, Muslim Hadith. Right. So we're... We're, we're often told that the, the God of the Bible and the God of Islam are the same God. But we're seeing, just on this point alone, about women, we're seeing a stark contrast between these uh, supposed revelations from God. Mm-hmm. And they don't agree at, at all with each other, right. which to me would indicate that perhaps we're not dealing with the same God mm-hmm. in these two religions. Perhaps the God of Islam is different than the God of the Bible. Right. Okay, so anyway, uh, about prophets from this God, Dr. Badawi on page 13 uh, says there are no women prophets because the demands and physical suffering associated with the role of messengers and prophets is the reason there are no women prophets. Uh, he's saying that they aren't you know, physically and, and I guess emotionally or whatever strong enough to do that. Well, who said that they, they, they can't? There have been lots of, uh, of godly women prophets or prophetesses. Muslims recognize Miriam, the sister of Moses, as a godly woman, Exodus 15.20 says she was a prophetess. Deborah was a prophetess in Judges 4.4. Less well known is Huldah, the prophetess in 2 Kings 22.14 and 2 Chronicles 34.22. In Luke 2.36, Anna was a prophetess who recognized the baby Jesus as a Messiah. Uh, Also in Joel 2.28 and Acts 2.17 says that both sons and daughters will prophesy. We have copies of these books from before the time of Jesus, and the Old Testament books, that is. And Surah 546 says that Jesus confirmed the Torah, of which Exodus 15.20 is a part. Our point is to present an accurate view of Islam to balance what many modernist Muslims are saying. Lest someone mistakenly think that we're antagonistic toward Dr. Badawi, we want to bring up an instance in his book where Dr. Badawi is at variance with much of uh, Muslim scholarship. But in this instance, we think it's Dr. Badawi who is correct. First, we'll look at the quotes that define Sharia, and then give a common Muslim interpretation, and then Dr. Badawi's interpretation. Okay. Bukhari 9, uh, 219, page 170 and 171, he, that is Muhammad, said, never will succeed such a nation as makes a woman the ruler. All right. Narrated Abu Bakr. During the battle of al-Jamal, which means the camel, Allah, Allah benefited with the word I heard from the prophet. When the prophet heard the news that the people of Persia had made the daughter of Khosra their queen or ruler, he said, Never will succeed such a nation as makes a woman their ruler. This is Bukhari 9, 219, page 171. Note that the context Muhammad originally said this was when the Persians made a woman their ruler. However, also note that the application of this, saying benefited Muslims after Muhammad's death at the Battle of the Camel, when Aisha tried to defeat Caliph Ali. So while the immediate context was Persia, the applicability was universal for after that. The next two hadiths, that is Bukhari 9, 220, and 221, page 170 and 172, said that when it was mentioned that Aisha has mobilized Basra, the response was, but Allah has put you to test whether you obey him, that is Allah, or her, Aisha. Surah 434 says, men are the protectors and maintainers of women because Allah has given the one more and strength is not in the Arabic, but it was there, than the other, and because they support them from their means. That's it. There's nothing else in Sahih Muslim, Bukhari, or the Quran saying women cannot lead. Surah 434 does not mention leadership. Based on this single verse in Bukhari alone, many Muslims think women should not be presidents, governors, or in any government leadership position. Dr. Badawi gives a number of weak arguments, but he also has a very strong one. Dr. Badawi says the only restriction given is the ruler of a nation. No restriction of any government job is given, and even Muslim authorities such as Al-Tabari accepted women as judges. In contrast to this, in the Bible, Deborah was the top leader of Israel, a judge, during the time of Barak. She was a godly woman and a godly leader, and God never gave any hint that either she was wrong or women who emulated this Bible hero were wrong to do so. Israel succeeded at this time, too. Now we'll move on and talk about the role of wives in Islam. 
The wife needs her husband's permission for a lot of stuff. It says the wife cannot fast, and this is a supererogatory or voluntary as in versus mandatory, or allow someone to enter their home without her husband's permission. This is Abu Dao, Volume 2, 2452 and 2453, page 677 and 678. Outside of Ramadan, a wife can only fast with her husband's permission in Ibn Majah 3, 1761 and 1762, page 62. Muhammad did not rebuke a husband who beat his wife for praying and fasting extra. Abu Dao 22453, page 677 and 678. That's... that's pretty amazing. Are, are we to imply from that reference that the viewers at home are looking at that if a woman prays extra or too long, mm -hmm. uh, she can be beaten by her husband yes. for doing for just simply trying to talk to Allah in this case. Yes. So a woman or a wife in this case can get beat up by her husband uh, legally under the religion of Islam for too much prayer. That her, that her husband doesn't like. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot more about beating and and, and both in those times and now in the, our second video. But that's right. right. So uh, to me, that's fairly astonishing. Whereas the God of the Bible, the God of Christianity, the God of Jesus Christ, would have us in constant communication, pray without ceasing. The Apostle Paul says, mm -hmm. uh, to be in communication through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, through the Word of God in the New Testament, we we have this constant communication. And uh, as a Christian, and of course that's what Steve and me are, it, it is just totally amazing that you can be beaten for simply talking to God, and that's what God asks us to do as his children, according to the New Testament and, and, and the Old Testament, for that matter, with right. the, the scriptures, particularly if you look at the book of Psalms, King David's Psalms, and, and, and so forth. So once again, I would emphasize to our viewers, we're seeing a stark contrast between the the God of the Bible and the God of Islam. We always are being told that the God of Islam and the God of the Bible are the same God. But how can the same God justify in Islam the beating of the wife by the husband legally for simply praying, whereas this would be unheard of from the biblical perspective? I suggest that we do not have the same God in these two religions, but actually two different entities. And I'll leave that to your you know, as we continue here, your imagination is to what entity is running this religion that would allow the husband to beat up his wife for simply praying too much, and the other religion would, which yeah, would have well, us it, praying. It, it doesn't actually say beat up, it says beat. But. Right, okay, I, I apologize for using that, yeah. but you can almost get that imagery in your mind that the husband's beating his wife mm. for simply praying, and to me that's just more astounding. than she's supposed to. Well, yeah. another thing that strikes me odd is that men tell their wives when to take a bath. Says, now, if anyone makes his wife wash and he bathes, bathes himself on Friday, he goes out early for Friday prayer, attends a sermon from the beginning, walking, not writing, takes a seat near the imam, listens attentively, and does not indulge in idle talk, he will get the reward of a year's fasting and praying at night for every step he takes. This is in Abu Dhab uh, 1, 345, page 91. So the husband gets a reward for, among other things, having his wife take a bath. There's nothing that's mentioned in anything I've read about the wife getting a reward for the husband taking a bath, though. So, so if I'm a Muslim man, I can just tell my wife, take a bath, and I'll get a reward. Right, but, if, you, if you do that and other stuff, yeah, right. You know, sometimes I've been out jogging or something, I come in the house, and my wife tells me, yeah, you're smelly, go take a bath, <laughs> you know. But she won't get any reward for no, that. No, no. <laughs> Outside of the fact that I won't be smelling up the house after I take a bath. Yeah, that, that reward. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, a, that's a new one on me as well. Yeah. Uh, amazing. Now, now another one that, that sort of makes sense, but when you think about it, it doesn't, is a woman should not give a gift from the joint property with her husband. This is according to Abu Dhab, uh, Volume 2, 3539, page 1006. And it says, this is generally because a woman lacks wisdom and intelligence. This is explained in Abu Dhabi, Volume 2, in the footnote, uh, 1006, on page 1006. So, in other words, you say, well, it makes sense that a woman just can't go give stuff away without her husband knowing about it as joint property. There's nothing that says a man can't give stuff away without his, without you know his wife's consent. Well, over and over again, I, I think our viewers are seeing this, this pattern that's developing of... The, the, all the advantages seem to lie with the man and not the woman. 
when it comes to the religion of Islam. And there, and there are over lot, and over and over and over again. Right, and 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 the 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 woman is like maybe a little higher than a slave, but sometimes not much. Well, you know, at least maybe at Christmas time she could. Uh, she, she might be able to give a. I, I know in Islam they don't really work. To, you know, give gifts at at Christmas time. But let's say as an example, maybe she wants to give her husband a gift. Uh, at least she could do that, and her husband would be happy. Right? Yeah. I mean, she she uh, she doesn't need her husband's consent to just give a gift away. Is that right? Well, she would to give it to somebody else. Though. Oh, but but she is allowed to give a gift to her own husband. Yeah, I, I have to say that that they don't. I haven't seen that covered, and I certainly haven't seen Christmas covered. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that because I noticed on this next PowerPoint, you have uh, uh, a wife cannot give a gift, and people can see it on the screen. A, a wife cannot give a gift without her husband's consent. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm, I'm looking at that, and you have your reference right there. Ibn Majah, page 423. So wouldn't that even include giving a gift to her husband? I, su or, I, I, I suppose so. Um, so I'm thinking maybe she could get in trouble for even giving a gift to her husband unless yeah. he gives his consent. Yeah. yeah now the, the, I don't want that golf club. You didn't yeah. have my consent. <laughs> now, yeah. now the thing, the thing we have to run, run into here is that uh, probably a majority of Sunni Muslims are not uh, familiar with their own hadiths. And right. so we majority of Sunni Muslims don't necessarily follow everything in the, in the hadiths. They follow to, to varying degrees. Well, it, it's very similar to all the nominal Christians we find in the Christian church. Uh, you have all these churches in Christianity and all these people claiming the Bible, but yet they don't really read the Bible. They don't know that much about the Bible. They're more into rituals or traditions. And uh, the same could be said of Muslims mm -hmm. in a large degree. They're not familiar uh, to a large degree with their own writings, their own teachings, their, their own scholarship. So right. they kind of just go along in life kind of, uh, going, you know, doing what they have their own personal preferences for, and and also from the ignorance that they have of not knowing things that they're supposed to know about, they simply don't know, so they just yeah. omit but it from their lives. Moving on, there are a lot of different uh, differences on divorce too that they might not be aware of. Uh, for example, uh, men can forsake wives, but the men women cannot forsake husbands, and this is according to Bukhari, Volume 7, uh, 121 and 122, page 93. And volume seven, chapter ninety-three, um, and that's uh, uh, also seven one thirty, page ninety-nine. And now here's the interesting thing: paradise has a strong smell, a strong good smell. Uh, this is according to Ibn Majah three two o five four and two thirty-six. However, a woman who asks for divorce without extreme reasons is forbidden the smell of paradise in Ibn Majah three two o five five, page two thirty-seven, or it could say extreme reason, or a similar hadith says the same except strong reasons in Abu Dhab, 2, 22, 18, uh, page 600. Now, th th this is kind of interesting that the man had, had, has, has no um, uh, punishment if he divorces when, when, he, when he wants, um, but a woman can do that. By the way, this penalty of not having, a, a, of, of being forbidden the smell of paradise, um, this is the same penalty that a that a Muslim man has if he kills a non-Muslim unjustly. It's right. the only penalty. And we've he has. covered this in some of our other videos, and we've got quite an extensive, as I've already mentioned, an array of videos on Islam. But uh, that is mentioned in the uh, Hadith, where when you say the smell of paradise, in other words, he can kill a non-Muslim, but he'll still go to paradise. But he simply can't smell right. all the great aromas. Just you know? j just like the women who do an equally bad thing of divorcing their husbands. Without right. strong reason. Right. So, interesting there. Once again, the upper hand goes to the man. Okay. <laughs> so. so, if you're keeping score here, there's not a whole lot in one column here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so uh, it, here is an interesting, I uh, guess, example in Abu Daud, uh, Volume 2, 2230 and 2031, page 603. It says, a man became a Muslim and his wife knew about it. Okay. She became a Muslim, divorced her husband, and she married again to somebody else. After the man told Muhammad, Muhammad took her away from her current husband and gave her back to her former husband. Notice that the woman really had no say in who she preferred to be with. So she couldn't divorce the husband. The husband could easily divorce right. her, but she doesn't have a say in the matter. Right. And, and so in this case, the Prophet Muhammad himself. 
just say just said, hey, back to the other one. Yeah, no choice. That's it. Now, there, there, there's there, uh, some people think that uh, Islamic morality and maybe Judeo-Christian morality are the same. And while they have some similarities, there are some marked differences. And one difference uh, is, is the concept of temporary marriage. Now, in temporary marriage, it, it's, it's, it's a man or woman who agree to be married for a period of time, maybe a night, a week, a month, something like that. And, that, and when the time expires, they're automatically not married anymore. And this okay. is an actual Muslim Islamic teaching? Yes. Now, we'll talk about where it's practiced and where it's not practiced in a okay. second. But it says, uh, narrated Ali bin Abi Talib. On the day of Kabar, Allah's apostle forbade the muta, muta's temporary marriage, and the eating of donkey meat. This is in Bukhari 5, 527, page 372, as well as Ibn Majah 3, 1961, 1963, page 180 and 182. And Bukhari 7, 15, 52, page 36 and 37 also discuss temporary marriage. Okay. Now, most but not all Sunni Muslims uh, believe that temporary marriage was okay in uh, Muhammad's time until toward the end of his life, but then Muhammad prohibited it and it's not practiced anymore. Now, there are a small number of Sunni Muslims that disagree, but the majority say that. However, this is a key difference between Shiite Islam and Sunni Islam. Well, maybe not a key difference, but one of the differences in that Shiite Islam, uh, temporary marriage is allowed to be practiced today. Mm -hmm. And in Iran, for example, I heard that under Khomeini, uh, they, they, they exhorted the youth to say, you know, don't just go out and have extramarital sex with, you know, somebody else. At least, you know, make it a temporary marriage, and then it'll be okay. I see. So, in a way, it's almost like uh, legalized prostitution, it almost sounds like to me, because you could marry some woman for a night, right? as you mentioned before. Well, let's get married for the night, and then in the morning, after we do our thing, will not be married anymore. And, yeah. But it's legal during the night, and after that, you know, I'll just right. go my way, and then I can go marry some other woman for another night. So I could actually have like seven wives in seven days. Or 365 wives and times yeah. four in a year. That's right. That's right. So um, uh, uh, there, there seems to be no limit with when you have temporary marriage that's legal. Under the well, they, 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 there are other things. That actually, there is a way where you can legally... Uh, two ways where a man could legally have sex with somebody else outside of marriage, too, but we'll get in the back of that in the next video. Once again, though, it doesn't sound like the woman can do that. Definitely. Uh, well, of course, obviously the woman's the other half of the temporary marriage. Right, but it's the man that arranges it. Um, for the most part, right. It, it, there is some consent with the woman. Now, there, there, there is a, another thing we're going to talk about. It's called the Musta Hill or, 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 or Mula Hill, depending upon the, the type of Arabic, and there's no real equivalent in English. But what it says is in Abu Dhab, uh, volume 2, 2192, page 592 to 593, it says, A divorced woman cannot remarry the same man until she has consummated a marriage with somebody else. So what this means is that if a man and woman have divorced, and they call this irre irrevocable divorce, meaning that they've, they, the man's pronounced divorce three times, and let's say that, so they're definitely divorced. And let's say the woman and man decide they want to get back together well, and, you know, be married again. Well, they can't do that until she marries somebody else and they consummate the marriage. Okay. And um, so, uh, 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 so, so she just has to go out and have sex with somebody else right? before she can get back with and her in, former in, husband. And, and, and in Islamic countries, in some countries, there are men that basically the woman can pay them to fulfill this role. And, and, and it's not that necessarily she wants to do this, but she's doing this for religious reasons. Right, because this, the Islamic religion is forcing her to have sex with someone else in order to fulfill this law. Right. Which we, you just read. Right. But we've got uh, less uh, than four minutes to go, so you know, continue to okay. read a few more of these, and then we'll have to wrap it up uh, for this uh, session. Uh, uh, all right, well, I just want to say that this is not only in Abu Dhabi. This, um, this is also in Ibn Majah 3, 1933, 1936. Um, page 165 and 168, and Abu Dhabi again, uh, 2302, 629. So the, the point here is the men don't have to do this. If the men want to get back together, they don't have to go out and, 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 and do they this. have sex uh, with somebody else. Things. Yeah. The, but it, it's, it's the it's woman only the that woman. has to. Yeah. So, so, so last thing I want to say is that if you're a, a woman, especially a Muslim woman, you might get the impression that you are inferior, uh, that, that maybe you feel guilty because it, you're, you're, you're a woman. But you shouldn't, because remember that, 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 that just because something is said to be that way doesn't mean that it really is. God made you, and just like everyone, God doesn't make junk, and you are just as valuable as, as, as a man. 
And it's not enough to follow the key truths of God, you know, for anybody, Muslim or non-Muslim. You have to also reject the false things, the false lies that, that contradict the key truth, the, 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 uh, the, the key truths. And so, if you have seen that you have accepted in the past any lies, you need to repent of that and decide to reject those and not go on, to, you know, acting like you still accept those and follow what you know to be true. You have any biblical references you'd like to conclude this show with? Well, yes, is that if you really want to see God, remember that, that nothing can separate God's children from the love of God. In Romans 8, 29 to 39, and 2 Corinthians 5, 5, and that we're to live a life of love through Christ. And that's true holy love, not this Musta Hill stuff, temporary marriage stuff, this inferior woman stuff, but 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 true love in God. Uh, in Ephesians 5, 1 and 1 John 3, 10 to 18. And please look up these these references and really see that the love that God has for you and the love that we're supposed to have our lives filled with. Right. Your life has some some meaning. Points to ponder. The God of Islam and the God of the Bible are not the same. Why? The God of Islam insults women by declaring that they are lacking in intelligence. The God of the Bible commends women. See Proverbs 31, the virtuous and wise wife. Matthew 22:37. both sexes are to worship God with all their minds, no difference. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, all Christians have the mind of Christ. 2 Timothy 1, 7, God gives all Christians a sound mind. Hebrews 8.10, God puts his law into his people's minds. 1 Peter 1.13, all are told to gird up their minds without any distinction given. The God of Islam demeans women by giving them greater punishments for the same sins committed by men. The God of the Bible is holy and just, and therefore his judgments are righteous and equal for all whether they be men or women. James chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. The God of Islam lacks compassion for women, as expressed in the numerous authoritative hadiths which form Islamic law, such as wife beating aloud, two women witnesses equal one man witness, etc. The God of the Bible expresses love and compassion for women. Jesus himself expressed compassion for women throughout his lifetime, See John chapter 4, verses 6 through 42, the woman at the well. John chapter 8, verse 3 through 11, the woman caught in adultery. Mark chapter 7, 7 through 13, the woman with the alabaster box, and many more. The God of Islam denies women as authorities eligible to be rulers and judges of nations. The God of the Bible allows women to be rulers and judges. See the references previously given in this program. The God of Islam allows for temporary marriage, mustahil, of any length of time. This is allowed for men, but not women. The God of the Bible calls the Islamic doctrine of temporary marriage a sin of fornication and a damnable practice. See Romans chapter 1 verse 29, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9, 13, 18, Galatians chapter 5 verse 19, Malachi chapter 2 verses 14 through 16. God hates divorce. The God of Islam has a different Jesus. The Jesus of the Bible is loving and compassionate. Jesus claimed to be the light, the Savior, and the Lord of the world. Find out about this Jesus, whom Islam has not told you about. For the sake of your own soul, read the Bible. Remember what Jesus said in John 14, 6, No man comes to the Father except by me, Jesus Christ, and he showed the love of God for you. Thank you so much for being with us. Steve Morrison, I'm Larry Wessels. God bless you.